Mike and Mike show. Um, it's Mike the Elder, Mike Dennis, <coughs> uh, who's an architect in Boston, uh, who does tremendous work, uh, has been working in cities uh, for as long as he can remember, uh, probably before I was born, and um, has an office, Michael Dennis and Associates uh, in Boston, has done a lot of re really wonderful campus master plans. And we have uh, Michael Lacutus, Michael the Younger, who is uh, one of the best three deans, I, th I think the three great deans in this country at this point of architecture schools, and I put Michael in that category. Uh, so, um, and Michael uh, teaches, uh, uh, hails from Greece, uh, teaches at the University of Notre Dame and has turned that school into a powerhouse of classical architecture. Um, but he has other feelings too uh, about architecture, not just what his school teaches. And he's going to share some of those with us today. So without much further ado, um, Michael Lacutis. <coughs> thank you, Dero. You're much too kind to me anyway. But thank you all for coming. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, which is very appropriate, I think, to the times that we live in, uh, is uh, the architecture of uh, 19th century Athens, and in particular the facades of the city. Um, Athens, uh, in, from 1830 to about the mid part of the 20th century, uh, developed uh, a very strong uh, architectural character that was continuous from all demographic groups, from the rich to the poor, the public to the private. And it, it did so in a time of economic frugality, or as I like to say, austerities. And austerity is no stranger to Greece of the last 200 years. Um, but uh, that's the overall topic. And we'll go through all the, the slides, and uh, I'll show you some diagrams and, and, and facade studies at the end. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying you know, that, that for all the world, essentially, cities, towns, and villages are really stage sets for the common enterprise of civilization. Uh, the facades of a city facilitate our public and private natures and mediate the tension between these two aspects of our existence. We are social creatures and we find knowledge, inspiration, and joy in the company of others. The opposite of our social nature is the need for privacy. We gain security, inspiration, and comfort in the privacy of our homes. We cannot be isolated for long periods of time, and we need to return to the public realm after being charged, recharged from our isolation. Another part of the private realm is, has traditionally been commerce. The need for identity, to compete and buy for excellence, is as much a part of the human condition as the need for collaboration and cooperation. The city, with its public and private spaces, facilitates this dual nature of humanity. The fabric of a city is of the private realm, and offers privacy and shelter and commercial entities that offer the competitive and individual enterprises that make up the vitality of a culture. On the opposite side, the public realm is made up of capital buildings, town halls, libraries, schools, and other public institutions that both celebrate the accomplishments of a culture and facilitate its governance, education, and broader common aspirations. These diagrams of Leon Creer you know, sort of indicative of, of those principles. With respect to buildings, walls give us privacy and identity, and openings modulate the relationship of a space to the outside world. Thus, at one end of the spectrum, bathrooms and kitchens usually have small windows, for example, and on the other, living rooms and public rooms have large ones. Colonnades and arcades, which can be seen as walls with much of the material removed uh, as possible, and help them be structurally sound, make the most porous connections between the public domain, such as streets, and the spaces behind them. Together, at both ends and scales of urbanism and architecture, the city with its streets, squares, and blocks, walls, openings, and roofs facilitates a delicate balance between private and public. The facades of individual buildings perform these functions, and architecture has, over the ages, brought artistic principles of composition to further enhance this stage set of our lives next few minutes, I'd like to discuss how these aspirations found as expression in a period of great economic austerity and political turmoil in 19th century Greece, and in particular Athens. The architectural unity that evolved was profound, a profound lesson in placemaking, alongside the creation of a new national identity for Greeks 
who had just emerged from centuries of cohabitation with the Ottoman Empire. This unity was created by two forces, one top-down from the newly formed government of Greece that included a young king from Bavaria and a Danish, German, and French entourage, uh, architectural entourage. Uh, they brought with them a reinvented classical ideal to its birthplace. The other was a bottom-up force made up mostly of builders and developers, self-taught or trained in technical vocational schools of the time. The neoclassicism of Athens differed from its European counterparts. It was gently scaled to the landscape of its rediscovered home, acclimated to the geological and meteorological conditions of Greece, and calibrated to the economic scarcity of the young nation. So what I'd like to illustrate are the principles that, sh that helped shape the making of the facades of neoclassical Athens, how the rubble walls of the city, uh, the city's buildings, were given nobility and monumentality through humble materials such as stucco, plaster, wood, and the sparing use of marble through veneer when appropriate. But first, a quick urban history of the town or city. This is Athens at the signing of their London Protocol in 1830 that, uh, that ensured uh, Greece's independence from the Ottoman Empire. It, it is now a little medieval village of about 6,000 inhabitants, and it was to become the capital of the modern nation that would build its new identity on an ancient past. The plans of, uh, the, the, the master plans for Athens of Stamatios Kleanthis, uh, a, a Greek national, and Eduard Schaubert, uh, an Austrian, uh, both students of Carl Frederick Schinkel, uh, was adopted as the official master plan for the new city. Uh, the, that's uh, the plan uh, at the top. Uh, the triangle plan, as it came to be known, located the palace on the low-lying area to the, on the north axis with the monuments of the Acropolis and the Roman Agora uh, at, at, at the lower end. And either side of the palace, along the diagonals of this triangle, the civic and religious buildings were located. In addition, deep houseman-like cuts to the medieval fabric were made to make way for new streets, squares, and blocks, preserving only buildings of antiquity and of the church. Unfortunately, this plan proved rather unpopular with the denizens, which resulted in significant political unrest. Uh, the, the famed neoclassicist Leo von Klenze was hired to make the triangle plan, to take the triangle plan and improve upon it. That's the plan at the bottom, and this resulted in significant change, uh, in few significant changes, uh, mostly in the relocation of the palace and a few other uh, significant buildings, but didn't really address the, the problem of how you cut to the city and take people's homes away. So finally, the plan of uh, uh, Frederick von Gardner, another Bavarian architect, made the modifications that pacified the opposition, and the plan was implemented in the late 1830s. The major changes here included the slice of only a few major avenues through the medieval fabric and the location of the palace to the highest part of the city. That's to the, to the right. Uh, this is a photograph taken in about 1930 uh, of Athens and uh, is uh, towards the east showing the comparative scales and, in, and intersection of the medieval village and the neoclassical city. To the right at the top is the palace, right there. Uh, now it's the parliament. And uh, to the left is uh, what has been called the Athens Trilogy, three buildings by the Hansen brothers, Theophilus and Christian, consisting of the National Library, the university and the National Academy. Next. So those three buildings there. Further to the top, uh, on the upper left, can be seen the residential fabric of the uh, new classical city that followed the scale and grain of the old quarter found in the lower right of the, the medieval fabric, uh, albeit now it is uh, arranged in a hippodamian grid. Uh, this is a view of, uh, the, of, uh, of Athens, again, uh, a little bit later than the previous photo, and focus on Syndigma Square, one of the main, uh, one of the two major centers of Athens. You can really see from this, in this photograph, the, you know, the, the connection between the public and the private buildings. Uh, you can see the, a complete range of, ar of architectural character in terms of how the, 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 the houses of the, of the wealthy versus the houses of the poor were arranged. 
and, and it's a great architectural continuity between all of these different realms. Uh, this is a view, view down Eolo Street, which was thought to be the major boulevard uh, at the time between uh, the other center uh, of Athens known as Ammonia Square. Uh, the street was the principal axis that aligned a new city to the orientation of its future development. And it was organized to take advantage of an axial view of the Erexium up on the Acropolis and the Tower of the Winds, which is ju situated just uh, in the Roman garage, just south, just, just below the, uh, the horizon line. Uh, on the street. So back to uh, Syndagma Square, where the parliament and palace are. Uh, this, these are two views, one to the west on the left and one to the right uh, is to the east. And again, you're beginning to see the, uh, the architectural continuity, the proportional relationship between the openings, the, uh, the, 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 the neoclassical idea of, 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 of reinforcing that center bay in, in each, of, each of, the, of the buildings. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the more modestly scaled uh, palaces to the, uh, to the left uh, still refer to uh, the, the grand uh, event, which is the, uh, the parliament building. The facade study by Ernst Ziller, uh, a German architect, uh, uh, most prolific uh, practice of, uh, through two centuries, uh, indicates the effect of, of a new colonnade on the ground floor of the palace. And uh, this connects, I think, more effectively the uh, the building to the public realm that was in front of it. But then again, there's this beautiful proportional continuity between the, uh, the openings, which get smaller as the building get, gets, uh, uh, rises to the top, uh, to the top floor, uh, and, and, and the colonnade allows us permeability and accessibility from the, uh, from the square uh, to what is really uh, a public place. The Athens Trilogy, uh, each building sits in its own Acropolis, uh, uh, all done by the Danish architects uh, uh, Christian and Theophilus Hansen. They also uh, subscribe to the classical ideal found uh, in, 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 in Bavaria and being exported throughout Europe at the time. Uh, the materials, even though the, there is a monumental quality to the pediments, the porticos, they're actually still rubble walls. Uh, they're all been, uh, in the two buildings, uh, on the outer buildings, the library to, on the foreground and the academy in the distant background, that, which are veneered, everything is still made of very, very simple materials. And the university by Christian Hansen, uh, one of the first educational buildings, is almost entirely in stucco, but with very, very simple means and, and elements, uh, there's a great power conveyed about the public nature of the building, the, pub, the nature of the, of the spaces behind the facades, and uh, uh, again, at the same time, alluding to uh, the uh, architecture and elements of the Erechtheum, uh, not too far away, the capitals of the Ionic Order being the most uh, prominent part, but also the cornices and other proportional systems that were arranged uh, throughout the building. The National Academy, uh, with very, very simple typological elements, uh, co uh, created a very complex uh, processional sequence uh, from the street, from the main boulevard into the main space. Uh, was also veneered in marble, but also uh, adorned with uh, a, a very rich sculptural uh, program by the uh, Greek sculptor Vrotis at the time. The National uh, Observatory by Hansen. Uh, again, we really get a sense of the, the nature of the spaces through the nature of the opening uh, on, on the walls. Uh, again, modest materials, all stucco, tin roof, just painted. Uh, and uh, the, the, the observatory part actually turned around with a, a mechanical device that was hand cranked. Uh, von Flense also designed a, a church, the Catholic church for, the, for, for Athens. And uh, uh, this was proved to be too elaborate. So uh, the Greek architect, uh, which I know you probably cannot pronounce, but is Kaftanzoglu, uh, picked up the design and, and in a spirit of collaboration and cooperation, uh, redesigned it with simpler elements. Uh, the gone are the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the columns that project forward, the, the tall tower, and simpler massing, but yet kept the spirit of the, of the, of the building, of, of the original architect's intent. Uh, and also kept with the frugal spirit of, 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 of the city. 
Religious architecture in Greece at the time was, uh, had been stopped for about 400 years, and the Greek church was experimenting with different kinds of, art, uh, of, of church typologies, and they looked to, to Rome, actually, for that in the Renaissance. And so Katanjoglu uh, pr uh, produced uh, this design for one of the largest churches in Greece at the time, uh, St. Constantine. But what's interesting is to, if you really just analyze the facade in terms of the walls and openings, you really get a sense that the tower is made more tower-like because of the size of the openings. Uh, the nave is more uh, nave-like because of the nature of its openings and the string courses. And the processional sequence, which is uh, allowed to sort of pop out to the front to the facade, is given a kind of nobility and, and, and reference to Corinthian temples. Uh, 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 th through this uh, modest uh, portico. Schinkel's Schauspielhaus in, in, uh, in, in Berlin finds a new Mediterranean expression in this municipal theater in Piraeus. Uh, it has a, a Mediterranean scale. It's more permeable to the, to the elements, such as uh, the, uh, we're, we're in, in, in contrast to its Bavarian uh, counterpart. And um, the, uh, the Polytechnic School, uh, again, very simple masses, that the, the stoas of, of the uh, four buildings uh, uh, suggest the kind of the, the, the passageways behind them and uh, define the forecourt and the center court behind the main building. Uh, but also the, the, the whole urban block is being held in place by these very simple masses. So there's all sorts of things happening. Uh, an urban, uh, uh, the, the urban, the urban uh, uh, containment of, of, of the streets uh, around the precinct, and also the processional sequence uh, uh, through the precinct itself. At the same time, the layering of the facades uh, indicates very clearly the sort of the typological nature of the spaces behind them, be they public or private. The Zapian, the largest building in Greece at the time, and for a very long time, was, uh, 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 almost broke uh, the, the country until the, uh, 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 the entrepreneur Zapio gave the money to, to build it. But to make it possible, the building was done virtually entirely in stucco with very, very plain walls, save for the interior uh, court, which was elaborate. And again, the processional sequence from the front of the building to the center was given uh, uh, preference and, 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 and deference. In spite of the economy of, of, of the building, they did manage to put in the portico to really uh, outdo themselves with respect to some of the uh, architectural detailing. This Corinthian capital uh, was taken uh, as from inspiration from the Karajic Monument of Lysicrates, which is the first known exterior application of the Corinthian order, and was given a kind of new life, a, 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 an ebullience that was kind of uh, unique uh, in, in Athens at the time, uh, with, a, with a wonderful sort of delicate solid void relationship in, in the articulation of the acanthus leaves and the scrolls. And, but uh, austerity was more the norm, and in this uh, composition uh, by Captain Zoglu, again, we see very, uh, a lot of wall expands, few windows, but whatever openings there are, are done with a great sense of economy. Uh, later on in the century, as uh, money and, and commerce uh, uh, made a more elaborate architecture possible, uh, this residence, uh, which later became the post office, uh, came about uh, also hearkening back to 19th century Italian uh, architects in, in, in Rome, Milan, and other places. The domestic architecture, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start with the houses of some of the more wealthy citizens of Athens and work our way to some of the uh, more modest uh, buildings just so you can see that sense of architectural continuity uh, bet bet between uh, the, uh, the two demographic groups or, or several demographic groups. This is the uh, Karokopos house, which is now the Benaki Museum. Um, uh, Texas residence. Uh, again, uh, all the rustication, all of the articulation is all done with plaster and, and, and stucco. Um, this uh, is a side court house, and, uh, an apartment building or a multifamily residence with shops below. Again, we can look at the openings and understand the, the nature, the, either the commercial, the residential, or the public and private components of the house. And a more modest house, a more modest neighborhood of similar qualities. 
and uh, even a, 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 a more modest house with, again, but we can see the, the prominence of the center bay, the, the two doors on either side of that uh, uh, give access to the two apartments, one on the first floor and one on the second floor. An asymmetrical composition uh, by a builder. Uh, one, of the th uh, one of the very interesting things about uh, Athens is that so much of it was built by builders, uh, people that uh, had gone maybe to a trade school, but maybe not. Uh, they, there were cottage industries of iron making and, and terracotta. So the columns uh, may have been terracotta, the capitals were probably terracotta. And so a house like this uh, might, may allude to uh, certain monumental qualities, but in fact may have been uh, modestly uh, costed out. And you had a smaller single story house with uh, service qu uh, quarters in, 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 the, in, in the basement and the family lived up above in the main you know, where, where the uh, larger windows are. Uh, this is in the Placa area in the old medieval uh, quarter. Uh, shops below, the, how, uh, the, the, the family lives above. Again, very modest elements, but proportional continuity with the public buildings uh, and you know, the use of elements to tie them to others as well. And in this building, this was actually one of the Ottoman buildings, and uh, you can see where the neoclassical facade has been applied to the side. And here you can really get a sense that uh, even the, the medieval quarter was eventually beginning to uh, imitate the neoclassical uh, uh, ring around the city and being transformed. And it's now the, probably the only place in Athens where you can really get a sense of what the 19th century city looked like. Uh, Manolis Biris, uh, an architect and professor at the university, organized the facades of, ho of houses in, in, in this uh, 16 uh, uh, matrix, a uh, 16th place matrix. From left to right, uh, you're going from this prominently uh, uh, privileging the center to privileging the edges and asymmetry to the, as you go more to the right. And as you go from the bottom to the top, uh, he privileges the, 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 the punctuation of, of that center bay in terms of pediments and in terms of being pushed out. Uh, I think there's more complexity to architectural facades in Athens at the time, but since I've just started thinking about this recently, uh, I'd like to come back to you some other time and talk more about it. But here's the, here's some line drawings which show the complexity and, and delicacy of the ornament and of the, of, of the architectural character that was developed. Uh, this is a, a center bay, again privileged with a central entrance. Uh, central bay privileged with a pediment and the two entrances on either side for a duplex. Uh, here the center bay is a little de-emphasized but has the same principles of you know, being the, the, the dominant uh, organizational element and, 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 some, and setting up the symmetry. Here it becomes a little bit more diffuse. Uh, there's two main doors to either, on either end of the house and and there's a main entrance on the center. And the balcony in the center, of course, gives that the residual effect of privileging that center bay. And here things get a little mix, get mixed up. I mean, there's, an, there's a local symmetry amongst the, uh, uh, on, on, the, on, the third, on the third floor uh, with the replacement of the, of the balcony and the two smaller windows on either side of that. On the second floor, we have the, the residue of that organization, but then the, the entrance is asymmetrical. And then on the bottom floor, there's another local, implied local symmetry between the basement door and the two smaller windows on either side. So this begins to uh, a, a more humble house, but has actually a quite a complex structure to it. And finally, an almost vernacular composition with you know, a proportional continuity to the rest of the city. In this uh, uh, street sequence, the more it goes from the more elaborate house to the more simple house, and again the, the whole center bay privileged and occupied center of uh, the implied column on the building on the left uh, develops into a tripart scheme as you go towards the right, ending up in in a, in a two bay scheme on the far right. But despite the different wall to opening ratios, 
despite a different level of elaboration, the streetscape has a, a, a remarkable degree of continuity. And uh, we'll now look at various uh, elements of uh, uh, the, uh, the compositional qualities and proportional systems that informed the, the shaping of, of these houses. Uh, the, golden, the use of the golden section, the use of, of, of squares, and again, remember, it wasn't just architects that were doing this, it was just builders. And in some cases, such as in this house, uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the number of circles in, near the center bay, that, which represent the diameters of an, a, a hidden uh, architectural order, there was another level of organization and, or, uh, and proportional unity that was, uh, con uh, that was developed for each of these buildings. So it was, it was a complex enterprise to actually design and build one of these, even though the actual elements were very, very simple. And even a small, modest residence. Uh, my colleague Richard Economakis and I, uh, many years ago, designed uh, two guardhouses for the parliament building that you saw earlier. And what we did is we used the proportional systems that we had uh, understood from neoclassical Athens uh, to uh, dictate the, the size and dimensions and, 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 and relationships of the various elements. So we used the golden section, we used the square and diameters and modules as is customary in classical architecture to develop it. So this gives you a, a sense of how one might uh, use these systems in modern times as well. And another uh, example, not too far, well, far from here, but not too far from the American mainland, which is in Ithaca, New York, uh, a proportion analysis done by my colleague, uh, uh, Norman Crow, uh, on, on this uh, wood clabbered house, which has local symmetries, uh, root tube instead of uh, 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 a golden section proportioning. But yet, uh, you know, the vernacular is also subject to classical principles that can help organize it. So uh, ultimately, what uh, this tells us for, that we can take away today is that an architecture of austerity uh, doesn't have to be uh, at, the, at the expense of uh, a, a great city and, and, and great architecture. It does say that when one has few resources, that one needs to um, uh, build with a sense of investment for the future, conserve uh, one's resources, uh, and uh, in fact today what we're doing is building with a, with, with a culture of con uh, consumption and waste. And uh, that's actually the real problem. It's not style, it's not character, it's not ideology, it's simple consumption and waste versus conservation and investment. And, the architecture in Greece was about uh, conservation and investment. So, thank you. Thank you, Michael, uh, for that overview. Uh, this amazing, thing looking at some amazing me. work there. Uh, we're now going to hear from uh, Michael Dennis. And I wanted to say that this is the third consecutive year that Mike has been uh, at CNU. So this is kind of building on what the two previous lectures uh, that Mike has uh, given at CNU. Uh, and this is a continuation. Last year he talked about facades uh, in Venice, uh, but he hadn't been to Venice in a while. And since then he made a trip to Venice to improve that talk. He got so we'll hear from Mike Dennis. Mike, let me just get your slides up. Is this thing turned on now? Yes? Great. Uh, you should write this up. Let's do this. You should write your thing up as an article. There's a lot of them that were burned out. And, uh, hard to see the details, but it would be good as an article. W we need to switch gears, and I'm going to go real fast. Uh, this is a way less intellectual uh, lecture than uh, Mike's. He knows more than I do. Uh, I've just been fascinated for a long time by uh, Venetian facades. Last year, uh, we decided, I decided that it might be a good idea to go and make a bunch of photographs of them and enjoy uh, Venice. Because to me, it represents 
uh, a way out of the classical dilemma. It's a way of looking at uh, building facades that don't rely on the classical orders. And the best Venetian facades were not the Renaissance ones. To me, that's the low point of uh, the development of Venetian facades. But <coughs> I left this slide in. This sounds weird. Does it sound weird to you? Speak up a little bit. OK, I left this slide in because I wanted to rag on Dan Solomon and, and others about uh, CNU and the need to uh, refocus things around dense urban communities based on the idea of sustainability and the diminishing resources. I use this slide with students, uh, and I ask them, obviously, it's peak oil, but it's peak economy and peak uh, resources and peak everything. And I ask them if they know what that pink uh, rectangle is. And of course, they don't have a clue. It's their careers. It's the 50 years of their careers on the downhill side of the slope. Their careers are going to be enormously different from ours. We've left them a mess. And they seem startled but uh, largely unmoved by it because they're young and don't know yet what's in, in score in, in, uh, ahead of them. <clears throat> if you pick up any book about modern architecture, early 20th century architecture, I guarantee you, you will not find one building that's an urban building. And by urban, I mean buildings that touch each other, that make continuous street walls. Not one. And this is a kind of Whitman sampler. And architects, obviously, were interested in things other than the city at that point. And you know what's going on these days in schools and in practice. Uh, it's who can make the oddest envelope. And these are not the oddest uh, of them all. But in fact, what you need for cities is uh, facades. So the argument of this uh, set of pictures, and it really is just a picture show, uh, is that no matter how beautiful uh, this Palladian building, the Palazzo Valmarana in uh, Vicenza, how beautiful they might be, it's very difficult to do this uh, today. It's very difficult for some of us to do classical buildings. And, and I, for one, have found inspiration in, in the kind of uh, Venetian Gothic pre-Renaissance and post-Renaissance buildings. So here's the way it's organized. Um, there's the antipasto, uh, the primo, the secondo, the insulata, I'm the formaggio, then there's the frutta at the end, and if we have time, the dolci, uh, which are pictures of Burano. So, this is Anna. Uh, Anna is a simple person. She's interested in what's going on on the street. She's eating an ice cream cone. You can tell it's in the warm part of the, uh, uh, the year. She has all these adjustable uh, accoutrements to uh, tune the environment, to keep the sun out during the day and let the cool air in at night, uh, and to shade things and be discreet. And more importantly, uh, it's the window, the figure of the window is proportioned to the human body. They're all about this wide, and they're casements. And they have a technical aspect to them, too, as you'll see in a moment. Now, you may not be able to see it, but Anna has a wedding ring on. This is her husband, uh, Leo. Uh, Leo, on the other hand, is not interested in mundane things, but cosmic things. Uh, he's interested in proportion and measure and ideal cities and all the rest of it. He's also promiscuous. You'll see him uh, in a couple of things more. So you can obviously imagine that there's a set of regulating lines based on the human body in even this vernacular building. And then there's uh, Leo's world, which is the world of art, of figures on fields, and this brings up the idea that in these Venetian facades, there are two kinds of things. There are figurative things that shift and change the more you look at them. And there are grids or fabric aspects to the facades as well. And it's the manipulation of the fabric and the figure 
that make the uh, facades active and interesting. So there, there they are uh, both together. And this is just a uh, homage to my Lacutus and uh, the Greek background to all of this. You know that the, um, the Kuros is symbolic of that column and that it has to do with a face and a face on the pediment side and on the lateral side, there's a kind of extended horizontal facade. And in the Greek things, what you see is what you get. There's a direct relationship of structure to the idea of the building. By the time you get to the Romans, um, they're, they're, they've invented space, urban space and interior space. And they've laid this concatenation of verticals and horizontals on a solid masonry wall, not to indicate how the building's held up, but to divide it up and proportion it into kind of human-sized uh, elements or bays. Uh, one of the favorite ones, of course, is the Ruccioli in uh, Florence. You could spend a lot of time looking at the proportions of these bays and the way the perspective, false perspective works or implied perspective. But you can't imagine uh, these Florentine buildings in Venice, they're done uh, for a completely different culture and with completely different uh, agendas. In Venice, the fact that they were safe from attack uh, for hundreds of years, if not a thousand years, meant that they could open the facades, make them abstract, and uh, didn't have to worry about defense. So, there's the lagoon. You know it's built, Venice is built on water and uh, soil just below the surface. And I thought this was cute. Uh, the Venetian palace is to the art of the facade as the French hotel is to the art of the plan. And as a matter of fact, they're both based on the same kinds of principles of asymmetry and recentering. But the important thing is that Venice, meaning the basic islands of Venice, could not be reached by cannon fire from the mainland. So Napoleon couldn't attack them from the mainland. If you came by ship, you had to go through these canals and there was a fortress right here. So fundamentally, they were safe. They couldn't be attacked and they were never conquered uh, by either the land or the sea until they gave up in, what was it, 1812, something like that. So they developed a basic building type, which was a, a long, deep unit, three bays in this case, with a long hall, the portico in the middle. And the end, the facade, was fundamentally a curtain wall. It didn't uh, have to be closed. And given the, the, the depth of this room, you could open it up. Not only could you open it up, but you needed to open it up to let light penetrate deep into the building. And the outside bays then had uh, a blank wall in the middle, two windows pressed out to the edge like ears on your, your head. And if you had a little money, you always built this uh, facade. These are the two components of the facade, the side bays and the center bay. If you had a little money, you built that. If you had a little bit more money, you could build two-thirds of a palace. And if you had a lot of money, you could build all, all three-thirds of the palace. So you can, this is the trickery of uh, Mr. Photoshop. Uh, you could have one bay, sometimes two bays, two side bays put together so that the middle uh, piece functions like a column. You'll see this again. Uh, or two-thirds of a building or three-thirds. Now, that's pretty clever. I'm real proud of this. Uh, watch again. It's amazing. It's, this version is just a dumb facade, a dumb run-of-the-mill Venetian facade. You tune the uh, proportions a bit, and these windows pack up around the center to make a bigger spot, and then a solid piece, and the windows on the outside. And they do this over and over again with all of these buildings. 700 years, they say, use the same building type. 
this guy ran into financial troubles, obviously. Got started on three bays and couldn't go further than to do one on the side. This you will never, ever, ever, ever find in Venice. Almost never. So the center bay is, a, is an independent building. There's also a kind of technical thing, other than the proportions of the windows. The, the buildings are often built of uh, rubble uh, brick, and then the window openings are framed in stone, Eastrian stone, to square them up and, and make them precise to take the windows. And the corners are often done the same way. Sometimes they're plastered over, sometimes it's uh, marble. And they're gradually elaborated uh, by these abstract uh, chains and ropes uh, to make, to square it up and make a panel. Sometimes it stretches floor to floor so that the figurative aspects of the window uh, get uh, an entourage around them to become part of the fabric of the facade, part of the gridding of the facade. And then, of course, the quatrefoil windows uh, that sometimes form the center portions of the bay. So there's Leo again. Uh, we did a series of analyses, collages of the Cadora in Venice. You can see Leo there. To explore both the figure and the field characteristics. Those are the balconies. You can now imagine that this is, uh, this center bay here is asymmetrical to the whole but it's restabilized by these balconies in the middle that are in the exact center of the facade. These are done by students at Cornell, actually not MIT. Not so bad. Almost Joseph Albers, huh? So here are a few uh, examples. I, I like these uh, ones that are this single building, the side bay with a blank panel in the middle. A kind of fancied up one with two windows on the side. Put two of those together, you get the column in the middle, which makes a kind of centerpiece out of the two windows, and, and then the, the, the eyes go out to the edge of the, of the face. Or you put one in the middle, and then you've got a, a kind of composite center bay with this, this set of windows and that set of windows functioning for both the outside bay and the central bay. Uh, these are fundamentally abstract uh, facades, very little in the way of classical uh, suggestions or ornament. All the strapping is simply uh, a plaster strap, maybe an inch uh, deep, inch sticking out of the plaster, but it shows the gridding of the, uh, of the facade. You could go on and on about these. The two bay one, uh, the famous one, the Caudario in on the Grand Canal, uh, where it's like the Cadora and that this is the, this center bay here is, is asymmetrical to the whole building, but it borrows this window from the side, so it makes an expanded figure uh, on the building. And then that window is in the exact center of the building, which is where the door is uh, on the bottom. So your eye shifts back and forth between the symmetry and the asymmetry. Another one where this is borrowed again to make a, a bigger spot and a kind of classic trick of shoving these windows up tight under the balcony so that they appear to be with the second floor windows. And of course the uh, earliest ones in Venice, the Palazzo uh, Loredan and Farsetti on the right where the center bay is almost indistinguishable but it's confusing because there's a double column here, but this is actually the edge of that center base. So there's a whole bunch of subtle shifting going on uh, in the facade.
in this case, this is a neoclassical one. Uh, the strapping and the window edges, the window trim, et cetera, the way they, they line up, produce this grid that has one primary spot in the middle and then it extends down figuratively down to this area uh, of the base. In, in this one, all of those windows work together. If you try to figure out what the primary figure of the facade is, the primary spot, you keep changing your mind back and forth because on the one hand it's this or on the other hand it's that, but then that expands out to here. And you notice the balcony, there are little gaps in between here and here which your eye jumps the gap and puts them both together and, and it borrows these windows on the bottom. Kind of amazing. And this is rental housing that is based on the same ideas as the high-end uh, palazzos. They're duplex apartments. This is a, an apartment here, a duplex, a, a floor and a floor, and then the reverse on the top, the main rooms here, and an attic above and they're paired up, and they're paired up in depth so that you get a whole range of apartments. These are all published by uh, the woman, uh, Trinconato, who did a study of these Sestieri in Venice, uh, the minor Venice, it's called. Uh, you can add extra pieces to get an expanded facade in both of these cases. I'm gonna go really quickly here. Pretty funky. If you took out some of the details, this would get you on the cover of the Rolling Stone nowadays. Uh, another one where there's a kind of, lots of times these were two-story buildings that they added a third floor and they shifted the idea between the main floor and the second floor. So when you put them together then, they, it's a very forgiving set of compositional ideas or components. Uh, it kind of doesn't matter so much when you begin to put them together. And you begin to see all kinds of uh, urban rhythms that you don't see when you look at just one uh, facade. Blank panel, center bay, I mean side bay version. So the, all of this adds up to this kind of mesmerizing continuity that we know uh, Venice to be. Uh, there's a little piece here about modern facades. Do you know what this is? It's Palladio's house in Vicenza without any architecture. It's just the figure ground of the facade. And if you put some horizontals on it, you begin to get a bunch of slipping planes, overlapping planes. And if you really get uh, reared up and, and going, you can put a triumphal arch on it, put a painting in the middle and you've got the basis for a whole series of uh, buildings by Le Corbusier and others. And there's one up, the Rio Schwab. And the Maison Plainex, where the blank panel is a bump on the building about six feet deep. In order to line up with the facade of this building on the right-hand side, whereas the basic part of the facade lines up with the building on the other side, so there's a kind of urbanistic overlap of these two uh, facades. In typical early fashion, he crops the photographs down to present only the white propaganda of the international style and eliminates the contextual aspects of the building. And of course, it's, I should have said, it's uh, obviously the reverse of uh, going from Florentine heaviness on the bottom to lightness on the top. Here it's light on the bottom and heavy on the top. Uh, his own uh, house in the Port Molitor, uh, which has a composition of bays and, and balconies. And then uh, this is a Farsetti that you saw earlier. If you look at the corner, this whole piece goes right through, it cuts right through the facade and has these little skinny columns uh, on the outside edge. No real sense of the weight being carried to the ground. And that probably is fundamental to the Corps Villa at Garsh, the facade of Garsh, uh, before he added the sex. You can imagine you were doing this facade and thinking, eh, well, it's not so bad, but it's pretty boring, you know? 
until you add the stuff, and then you get things cutting back from that surface, that taut surface, projecting out and projecting out and projecting out, and you get the asymmetries of uh, this being the center of this portion over here, and this being the center of the whole building, and that being the center of the portion on the right-hand side. Even uh, Tirani's Casa del Fascio is a three-part Venetian concept with these two bays forming a side bay, the three center ones, and the side bay again. This doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about or showing, uh, but I love this facade, so I just couldn't bring myself to take it out. It's the House of Dr. Van Neck by Antoine Pomp in Belgium done in 1912. Uh, it's a three-bay modern facade brick with these hanging bay windows uh, <coughs> excuse me, on the top, uh, kind of gymnasium floor. This pier goes all the way down. This pier, this pier stops. That pier goes down to the entrance way, which is cut underneath it. You can spend a, a lot of time looking at this facade. And uh, they've messed it up now considerably but because they've opened up this whole thing as a giant window and it takes a lot of the magic out of it. Uh, so you'll have to suffer quickly through this. Uh, I, I was chastised last year for not showing anything of, uh, of ours and I hated to go up against Venetian facades, but uh, I'll, I'll do it anyway. Uh, this is a project that we did a number of years ago at Carnegie Mellon. There's a, a performing arts building, a university center building, a garage, a dormitory, and a future building. And that's a view of the dormitory and the parking garage with a football stadium. They play junior college teams, uh, not uh, real teams, or junior high school teams, so it's not Ohio State. Seats may be 2,400 people in this, uh, in this stadium. Okay. Uh, all of the pieces the, of the building, there are normative pieces and special pieces, and they all have to do with the context where they're located within the overall organization. We do typically do various kinds of punched windows and large racks of windows, but almost never absolutely never continuous curtain walls because they seem to anesthetize uh, the buildings. So there's a view with the gap between the two buildings and these uh, racks of windows. The dining hall is down here. There's a whole argument about classically not turning the corner uh, with things going continuously around the corner so that there's a Flemish bond pattern on the bottom of the building and it turns up only where there's what we would call a facade that's articulated from the edges. Uh, there's an articulation here and then it turns the corner and then you've got another facade piece and so on. Um, that's a view of the uh, entry to the dining halls with studies above it and you can see the Flemish bond turning up but always articulated between the two. We never would take a molding like that and run it around a, a, a 90 degree corner. It's always trimmed off and stopped so it prefers one direction over the other. Uh, this is one of the Hornbostel buildings at Carnegie Mellon with these uh, giant windows, kind of an industrial Beaux-Arts uh, aesthetic. And our building, the end of that uh, dormitory building where the windows are grouped uh, together uh, to make patterns and to make the whole thing center up. It even stops in this case uh, right here and then again along that line. And the main entrance through the courtyard to this big drum, which is a big central space, uh, it looks like our uncle owns the window store uh, because there are these big racks of windows, there are these smaller punched windows little square punch windows, gun slits. Uh, we used almost every trick we knew uh, in this building, but we saw it as a kind of, not just a facade, but like this phoenix rising between the two bigger parts of the building. This is a view looking 
diagonally into it that the faculty club uh, with a pedestal for a future piece of sculpture which has not yet appeared. But a kind of trying to make a balance of real openings and window openings and a, and a balance of uh, frame to wall, a kind of uh, equilibrium between being a frame and being a wall. And Andres would say these are eyelasters. And he'd probably be right, but they're to us, they're pieces of wall. This also doesn't have anything to do with any of these points. It's just weird, and but we like it. It's the, like a spaceship that's landed making a porch and a very nice room overlooking the athletic field. This we had a lot of fun with. Uh, it was a project done with uh, two minutes now be done. Uh, I was always intrigued by the Borneo Sporenberg project in Amsterdam that West State did. The only problem is they make really stupid facades, really bad facades, but the idea was intriguing. So we tried to capitalize on, on the idea, uh, that idea and the idea of Venetian facades. So I had the students analyze the condor and make a collage, which, of which this is one. Uh, and then I extrapolated from this Venetian palazzo the proportions and designed an apartment building with a two-story space in here. In other words, the apartment's two levels. So there was two levels there, two levels there, one on top and one on the bottom gave them the apartment building, had them design a facade for it. And the only requirement, I tested it out to see if it would work, you know, dimensionally and everything, um, and put the, strung them together to make a kind of uh, long building or a street facade. And lo and behold, uh, they, it enabled them to get right in it and do some kind of uh, amazing Facades. This is a two-story high portion of that uh, apartment. This is another one, partially frame and partially uh, infill. Another one that has a kind of screen or a lattice over the front of the building. Another one, more frame expression. And then finally I had them put them together to make a street with three ideas. One was to use their own building, the language of their own building, and make a whole street. Uh, the second one was to use the, their, their uh, colleagues or their classmates' buildings together with theirs to make a street. And the third one was to find contemporary buildings uh, to put into the collage and make the street. And uh, they could get uh, good contemporary buildings like, like uh, Jimmy Moneo's building here or any number of other things. Uh, actually, that not that uh, from San Francisco? Stanley Sederwitz, yeah. What was really interesting was that because the floors lined up, you got the kind of borrowing back and forth between facades that you tend to find in Washington, D.C. In the, in, the, in the sort of row house uh, districts and in Boston. Uh, this was another one, slightly more extravagant uh, buildings on the bottom, but uh, kind of interesting in here and in here in the middle. And then finally the woozy one on the bottom, just to see how far you can push it and what you can get away with. All to explore the idea of guidelines and, and which guidelines you can do and what do they produce and how can you uh, enforce them. Just, this is real quick. They're just pretty pictures. There's not a shred of an idea to what's left here. Uh, but if you've been to Burano, uh, you know that it's a kind of amazing place. Burano, uh, the island uh, north of uh, Venice in the lagoon.
So, even simple things can be croissants. That's it. Thank you. Well, you obviously can't get around the classical touches as you're talking about. I mean, you strip those out and you've got flat beer, uh, or pretty flat beer. Uh, I was hoping that, perhaps naively, that the students would in fact become inventive in a, in a way that would replace that detail. It's very difficult to do in a short time, and it's I, I learned last fall doing uh, a workshop about uh, urban facades uh, that were uh, ecologically and technologically uh, tuned up, let's say, that it was a problem because number one, they don't know what urban is. Number two, they don't know what a facade is. Number three, they don't know anything about ecology. And number four, very little about technology. So basically left high and dry. So the invention to replace the classical details, which I think you could do, is uh, stillborn. Uh, the regional thing has to do with, mm, to some degree, the formal properties, but also the materials, like the Eastrian stone, and the fact that you're often building on water is gives another dimension to things. For example, the ground floors are often quite low in Venetian buildings, relatively low. But because they're on the water, you get the reflection and you sense, you, you have a different idea about the height of the building. But there are so few ideas uh, today and people are so um, attuned to doing things rationalistically, out, empirically out of some kind of argument that we tend to forget that ideas come from all kinds of places and that you can take them and transform them. That's what architects do. We spend too, way too much time on sociology and uh, history and uh, all of this stuff rather than what architects and planners traditionally have done, which is to have formal ideas. Uh, I was a little bit nervous about doing those the Venetian studies for Project in Providence, Rhode Island. But Providence is on the water. That was close enough for me. Um, I figured we could transform them. And uh, people have used the themes. I mean, uh, that blank panel building that Palladio used in Vicenza, which of course is was a Venetian subject, uh, but it was also used in the Casa Ducai in Florence and. Korg's stuff in Paris. Uh, it just depends on how many transformations you take it through, you know, how many times you launder it to get something new. Well, I told them. Let, let's back up. If you give most architects today, a, a, a project to do, you'll get a, most architects that are not at this conference, uh, you'll get some kind of screen wall with kind of goofy patterns in it, uh, you know, wrapping a building, usually of some kind of goofy shape, but not always. If you get students to make a facade and you don't tell them anything or set any restrictions, here's what they do. 
they, it's like they take a section right behind the edge of the building and they extend all the floors out and all the wa walls out and they fill the openings with glass and they're done. That's a facade to them. Uh, so I said you can only make 25% of the facade glass or opening. 25%. I didn't check it. But you will find that a lot of these Venetian palazzos, ones that I didn't show, have a huge amount of glass. It's the, it's the way it's done in the balance of the framey parts of the facade and the surface parts of the facade. Dan. No, no, no. No, I, they, I, I don't... Um, God, I'll, let me do it up here. Um, otherwise, you'll watch a hundred slides go by. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Dan, which one you were talking about, but, but I, I, I don't think any of them were flat beer. What I said was in response to the question about classicism, if you look carefully at even the, the neoclassical ones, the ones, the post-Renaissance ones, that are very abstract, they all still have balusters and, and little bits of classical detail here and there. If you took those off, you would have flat beer. But is this one that you meant? No, I meant the variety of the things that you've got to find and choose from and the surrounding and everything. So it's not the same. No, I like those. I mean, uh, Palladio I didn't like without the stuff on it, right? He needed to be have his clothes on. But uh, but you get to see that again. That's. Uh, No, 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 only the, uh, a lot of the rental units. Venice had rental buildings going back to the 14th century and beyond. And, and one way that they made them relate to the high art palaces was in fact to make them duplexes so they could get the same kind of language that the, that the big guys had. No, just, just the pure style of the facade. For 700 years, they used the same thing, you know, the same side bays. And they never really once built a, sing a building as a center bay. There were some kind of aberrant versions, but never a pure center bay. And everybody that came in, all these uh, classical guys from Florence and elsewhere that came and did buildings there, adhered to the same system. I mean, they stretched it, but yeah. Yeah, I think you're right.
faith thing is obviously real. I mean, look at Dan Solomon. He's got, you know, he's, he's got the figure, right? The, the figure of the nose and then the figure together with the eyes and with the, with the mouth on the field. And his eyebrows go out enough, they begin to work with his hair to make a kind of grid that his face fits in. <laughs> uh, I think it absolutely has to do with that. One of the, I think you would agree, one of the problems with making buildings today is that too many architects, not at this conference, uh, don't like to make punched windows. Uh, they want to make what used to be called fenestration, right? systems of fenestration. And when you do that, you lose the figurative characteristics of the building, that kind of balance between figure and field, between wall and opening. Yeah, Doug. Well, there's also the argument, although it's not in this building, that that's where the fireplace was, and you got a chimney out here and a chimney out here. But in fact, what that does, if you think back to the Cadoro, there's no sense of weight being carried to the ground. That's what, to me, makes it a modern facade, quote, cla classic modern facade. There's no sense of concatenation and of weight being carried to the ground. In fact, in the Cadoro, it's almost like <clears throat> the whole thing is a tapestry hung from the top, right? And it's like a taut skin. When you move the eyes out close to the edge, it's like stretching that thing totter and totter until you get a kind of drum-like surface. And I think that's what happen, happens with Corb's view at Garsh and... Well, that's what I haven't heard before, but uh, <laughs> I believe anything you say, so. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, these, 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 those were not buildings. They were, it was an urban design studio. And what we were talking about is uh, uh, plots and the effect that <coughs> plots have on the character of the street. I think you can probably make an argument that the narrower the plots uh, and, and varied ones make a more user-friendly environment than bigger ones because, in fact, architects have a hard time making. Most of us have two or three ideas at most, and we can put them in one small building, or if you give us a big building, we use the same two or three stretched out. And so the urbanistically, the smaller scale, fine grain things, I think, work better. You can't always do it, of course. And so they, they were not meant to be buildings, but um, I think that's what you meant by the scale of the building. If you meant one building being 45 or 50 feet high by 50 feet wide, there are lots of buildings like that. 
50 foot wide building? Gosh, they're all over. They're, you mean they're too small? Ah. Well, that depends on you know, how you manage the developers. But developers, above all, want uh, safety. Uh, if they can build something incrementally, lots of times they prefer to do that. Uh, and I think you could you could have a long discussion about this, having to do with uh, the how, how big are blocks and how much they're divided, how they're divided. I have wild arguments with Steve Peterson about this stuff. He doesn't believe, even though he lives in New York City, which has 25-foot plots, uh, he, he argues against it. I think you can write guidelines uh, to do this, and uh, it's done all over the world. Uh, Rob Career is doing all these towns all over the place that have smaller plots. Lower Manhattan had uh, small plots. They got a little bit bigger in the second phase, but, but they were relatively small in the beginning. You mean that? Yeah. You will never find this in Venice. This is fake. I mean, yeah. You, you find it other places, but it's curious that you will never find it in, in Venice. Probably because of the way the Palazzos are organized internally. You know, this was typically a long haul spanning the whole width of the building. That doesn't mean that you couldn't have a room on the front and a hallway behind it, but they never did it. Uh, maybe they never thought of it. <laughs> I don't know. Dan. Which two? If you look at Borneo's Kornberg, other than that one piece which has those little bitty houses, not so little, but uh, it's pretty clumsy and, and uh, relentless. I mean, the, there, it's, it's like any housing project with big, uh, long buildings or repeating buildings uh, rather than individual ones. The small scale portion, they had to pick different architects, no two architects. No architect could build a building side by side with his own building. So there's a variety programmed into it, but the rest of Borneo's Kornberg 
is not like that. In fact, they've got the density busters, these huge hogs of buildings that are kind of awkward and bad. But you're, you know, if you, if you go, I think there's a difference between row houses in DC and row houses in Boston's Back Bay. There are components to the facade that work together. There's a kind of magic that you can do one house with a bay and a half or two bays or whatever it is and then put it next to another house and there's a kind of borrowing back and forth so that you get a more complex urban rhythm uh, than if they're simply the same row house repeated over and over again. And those characteristics are things that came out in, in, that, in the middle portion of that street study because all the floor lines were the same. If you change the floor lines, you wouldn't get this, but they could do individually uh, each do a building, but because the floor lines lined up, you got transparencies and overlaps where a bay window and one appeared to belong to the building next door to it. Uh, and that was, to me, the fascinating part. The big problem is the, is the size of the parcels, though. Who, who was it? Uh, um, George Baird, I think, did a study in Toronto of parcel sizes and demonstrated that as the size of the parcel went up, the quality of the environment went down. And I can understand that. If you walk around any city, Boston uh, in particular, it's the human scale of the buildings, the variety of building sizes that make it, that give it a kind of lively human quality. Uh, and you get all kinds of arguments against it uh, from financial reasons and developer reasons and so on. And, and size of things that retail wants big floor plates. Well, I live a block away from a whole series of small floor plate shops. I'd say 80% of Boston is made up of small uh, shops, smallish shops. So it's somewhere there's a strange argument in here. But you guys know more about that stuff than I do. Don't ask me that, Hero. I'm getting close. <laughs>